But, <laughs> but I, I, I'm excited. I came here hungry. Um, I, I, uh, I am taking the latest flight possible on Saturday to still make it back to preach at our pulpit on Sunday. But I'm taking as much time as I can. I came here to receive from the Lord. And hopefully you did as well. I, you know, you don't, uh, you can leave me out of this equation uh, because I am a young buck in comparison to Pastor Bill and Pastor Benny. But I can tell you this, when the Lord sends uh, fathers like that into a region, it is wise to pay attention. And it's spiritually wise to not think that uh, the region will ever be the same. So I really didn't come here to uh, have another speaking engagement. I came here because I believe the Lord is going to build something very substantial uh, and, and, and plant a, uh, something in your heart and in this region that uh, is going to be a blessing to the entire area. Amen. So... If I were you, I would have my heart on a swivel and I would be listening. You know, I, I taught on this last Saturday, or Sunday, sorry. We, we don't have Saturday service. Uh, last Sunday, on Mark chapter 4, as the scripture says, he who has ears, let him hear. And he says that we are to take heed, the Lord says, of what we hear. And then he begins to speak of measure. For by the measure we use, the context is hearing, it's according to that measure that we will receive. So each of you will listen with a certain amount of your heart over the next three days. That will determine how much you walk out with. So if you're a little off, if you're a little distracted, uh, if, if you don't know how you got here, who are these crazy wild people? Why are people waving flags in here? I, just, I still don't know the answer to that one, and they're, they're our team. But... <laughs> We like them and they work. So, <laughs> But God brought you here for a reason. And if, if your heart doesn't feel as receptive as you'd like it to be, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. And he will. I said he will. Nobody here has to leave the same if they don't want to. And I think this is a very holy gathering. And my prayer is that this would, the testimonies of personal encounter with our precious Jesus would be too many to count. And that yes, we would encounter him corporately, but I'm praying for life-changing, destiny-shifting, nation-shifting. Never despise what the Lord can do with one yielded heart. You know, I, I do believe the Lord uh, longs to use a company of people Good to see you, Kathleen. <laughs> hey, how are you? I love y'all. Uh, anyways, Kathleen lives in Orlando. I was like, wow, where's Kathleen doing it? All right. Um, the Bible history is full of God raising up one person. It's not too popular, the teaching. God is glad to raise up a million, but few surrender at that level. And that's what I would encourage you to do uh, over these next three days. Amen. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, speak to us. We are open and we are hungry. Feed us with your holy presence and the beautiful word that flows from your heart. Touch us and keep us. Do a deep work in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm going to begin teaching. As I do, I'm going to ask that you stay as still as possible. Uh, oh, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good, thanks. That was you, right? Okay. <laughs> when I walked in tonight, I was reminded of our earliest meetings um, our first Jesus event was Jesus 14. 
And uh, we're now heading into our 10th straight year of doing that event in Orlando. We've since taken them out of Orlando. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to keep up with our California tour, but I've never been a part of anything like that. I would, of course, the events in Orlando have been in, uh, incredible, but when it comes to mass outpouring and power being displayed and the preaching of the gospel and, and just hunger, uh, I've never seen a region gripped in America uh, since I've been in the ministry and I've had the chance of being part of some pretty incredible ministries. Only thing I can compare it to is what I used to sense going into Pastor Benny's meetings when I worked them but we're literally watching thousands of people attend in Orange County, which everyone says is impossible. Uh, Pasadena was jam-packed. Thousands have been turned away. Thousands have been healed and saved. And I don't mean just like my, my blister on my toe went from a nine in pain to seven. I'm talking about paralyzed limbs, people watching uh, in hospitals and leaving hospitals. Uh, two people in a coma uh, in two different hospitals who were shot in a high school shooting. Um, on our first tour leg in San Diego, Jeremy Riddle was leading alongside of me, and I heard the Lord say, gunshot wounds, and I released it. Nobody raised their hand in the room. I said, wow, Lord, thanks for that. I feel really good about myself. And a lady was watching online. She had been praying for two girls who had been shot by assault rifles in her hometown. And she had been praying for two weeks for those girls. And she's a partner with Jesus Image. And uh, she claimed that in faith on the same day in two separate hospitals, both girls got up out of a coma. And the Lord touched them. All that to say, all that to say, I believe that the West Coast uh, is being primed for a true Jesus movement. And I used that, I'm not saying the word revival is illegal because it's not. The scriptures talk about uh, us being revived, uh, where, where literally our hearts should cry, revive us again, of course. But I'm being specific in using the Lord's name because the Lord is coming back for a people who are addicted to Jesus. It's a specific heartbeat the language of our pursuit must continue to be more clear and specific is this tracking you cannot be too in love with Jesus you cannot be too focused on Jesus the father is not insecure You know, I use this example. If my son, for instance, uh, plays competitive golf, and he's going to hate that I just said this. I, he may or may not be watching, but he just beat me for the first time at a really amazing course. And it, it, was, a, it was tough for me to take. <laughs> I don't take losing out there so well. But if I'm going to lose to somebody, you want it to be your offspring that you train, so that way you can take some credit for the pain you're <laughs> So... What type of parent, if um, their child were awarded with a trophy, what type of weird father would feel the need to run up during the trophy presentation, steal the trophy, and say, hey, that's my trophy. How about a little love in this direction? I taught him everything he knows. That's not the sign of being a good father. One of the signs of our Father in heaven being a wonderful father is that he is glorified when the Son is glorified. Does this make sense to you? So our passion must become more clear. The faith that's been handed down once and for all must begin to beat in our hearts again. We are in love with Jesus. Specifically this one who is fully God and fully man. Of course we love our Heavenly Father. Of course we love the Holy Spirit. But the Lord has made it so that it is impossible to come to the Father outside of the God-man Christ Jesus. He is the way and there is but one way. So that being said, there are great days ahead. And I believe the Lord will raise up people from this room who truly want to know the Lord Jesus Christ. 
the man from Galilee. Which, by the way, only happens by the Spirit. But as I came in, I began to think back of our journey, toward our journey, I should say. In the first year, we met in a church. And 60 days prior to uh, Jesus 15, we were told by the church that was going to host us that we could not have the church building. We pivoted as quickly as we knew how. I think we had two staff members. One was part-time. The rest were family <laughs> and uh, friends I grew up with who probably weren't even born again, some of them. But you don't need to be born again to set up a table. <laughs> and we went to the Double Tree right near Universal Studios. And it wasn't the venue that I dreamt of, but God came. I said, but God came. And I've said for years, give me a warehouse with hungry people over the nicest building with people who've seen they've seen God, think they've seen God do all he can do. And I feel something similar tonight. It's a similar progression. It's, we were there, and that second one came with a bit of a battle. And I'll just say this. When God starts moving, it is wise to uh, realize and look into who is pouring into you. But if you become a, an expert on another leader's shortcoming and have and are less of an expert on your need for the precious grace of Jesus, it's probably, it probably means you're about to get passed by. Wow. Oftentimes, preachers like us become more analytical than childlike. And so God has to raise up a little shepherd boy like David on the backside of a pasture who learns his presence with a harp. Jesus has to choose disciples who are fishermen over these studious children of the temple. Jesus has to recline in Bethany over Jerusalem and it's his city because the Pharisees were better at pointing figures, pointing fingers, I should say, than falling at the feet of the incarnate God before them. May the Lord raise up leaders in this city who want Jesus to be glorified more than they want to please people. And if you'll do that, God will touch you. That is not an excuse to throw out the need for purity. Purity is non-negotiable. If, if I have to choose to sit under teaching, well, let's say a guy sees less miracles, but his marriage is intact, and he loves the scriptures, and his children serve the Lord, and he preaches Jesus clearly. I'm going with that guy all day long. Don't get me wrong. But we must be careful when God starts to move and he sends his servants into a region. We must be careful that we do not forfeit our own encounter due to judgmental lenses. Are you tracking? I've been studying the scriptures intensely since I was a little boy. The first book I ever read was the book of Revelation at 12 years old. Freaked me out so bad. I had no idea what I was reading. But one thing it did accomplish, I didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> I knew that much. I'm like, I don't even understand any of this. I don't want to go into that lake of fire. Okay. I've never heard anyone say, when you start your journey in faith, start with Revelation chapter 1. But that's where I started. To this day, I'm still in seminary, and I'll probably be in seminary for the next, seems like, six years. So, 
I have a high, high value for truth, for the holiness of the Word of God. And what I want to say to you tonight is there, there is no scalpel that should separate our hearts from the pure living and preaching of Jesus and His presence. You do not have to sacrifice one for the other. Amen? May the Lord stir your hearts this week. And may He choose the hungry as He always does. Amen? All right. Take your Bibles, if you would. To Matthew 22. Well, I do feel like I have a word for you. I just I want to release it at the right time. If I don't give it to you on this trip, don't let me fly out. Okay? <laughs> Make sure I do. Matthew 22, verses 41 through 45. I'll begin reading. While the Pharisees were assembled, Jesus asked them, What do you think of the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Tonight, Jesus asks everyone this question. What do you think of the Christ? It's very similar to the Lord's dialogue with Peter. Who do you People say that I am. Oftentimes the Lord's, the, the Lord's questions begin uh, not in the shallow end, but they begin uh, in a little more gentle manner than we're used to. Who do they say that I am? And what he's really doing is to set us up to just run the Holy Spirit of his word straight through our heart. So he'll start by going, hey, what do you think of them? Oh, I'll tell you what they think of you. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're Elijah the prophet. Some say you're John the Baptist. The Lord doesn't stop there. He goes, oh, now let me corner you. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers beautifully and perfectly. We know Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, I want you to hear me and hear me well. The entirety of our life, the entirety of our eternity hinges upon our answer to that question. Who is Jesus to you? Now, whether he is or is not something to us does not change who he is. Like, if you don't believe in the second coming of Jesus, he's still coming. <laughs> doesn't matter if you want to believe it. You know, it doesn't mean you're going to stop it. He's coming. Now, this question is vital. Because what the Lord is getting at in Matthew 22 is you think you see the son of David properly, the Christ, but you're not. You think he is merely man. 
you think you get to add him to your life. Another way of saying it would be like this. Jesus can become part of your faith. Oftentimes, I, I use this example all the time because I think it's so telling. Did anybody grow up going to the doctor when they still had the children's Bibles in the waiting rooms? No? How many of you remember that? Okay. Uh, we went to a Christian doctor. It was like, my kids go to one. He used to be on TBN. And so, all kinds of Bibles in there. And <laughs> Kind of a wild way to grow up. But I remember seeing these little children's Bibles. They had pictures in them, illustrated Bibles. And you'd open them up, and they would start with Adam, right? And uh, he and Eve were walking around the garden, having a wonderful time. And uh, all of a sudden, this snake walks up to them. They have this conversation. It always shows uh, Eve handing the apple to, to Adam after she eats it. They get kicked out. And then it usually bunny hops, just skips a ton of biblical history. Usually takes you straight to Moses, right? Or maybe sometimes Abraham. And then the Red Sea parts at some point in that little children's Bible. It's really cool visually. Uh, and they walk through the Red Sea. Sometimes they show the cloud by day and the fire by night. And then it usually skips from, they usually skip all the prophets because they're too intense. <laughs> you know, we, we don't want to freak out the kids. So they'll skip. Uh, they might show David occasionally, uh, but they usually show his highlight reel. They'll show him kill Goliath. Not much about Bathsheba in the children's Bible. <laughs> you know, that's not there. Uh, but uh, they'll move into that Goliath story, skip most of the prophets, and then they show up to John the Baptist who looks like you know, a fullback from like a 1990s Chicago Bears team, hair everywhere, looks like he just wants to rip their face off. He's standing in water, right? And he's eating locusts and honey. Jesus shows up eventually as part of the timeline, huh? And he dies on the cross. They usually show the picture of him uh, multiplying bread and fish or walking on water. And then uh, he dies on the cross, is buried, raised again, and then the story ends with us going to heaven. Okay, everything I just mentioned, except for some of the John the Baptist narrative, is m mostly true. But what we've done without knowing, some cases we've done it knowingly, is we've made the Lord Jesus part of this story. And there's where you see that question come in. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. And really the reason they were saying that is because they were seeing elements of their ministry fully embodied in Jesus himself. He's the weeping prophet. He's like Elijah. He has authority over the heavens. He can multiply food. Man, that's pretty Elijah-like. He's calling people to repentance. That's very... John the Baptist-like. He's the bridegroom. John spoke of the bridegroom to come. What Jesus is saying here is, boys, I'm everything they ever uttered and ever wanted to be in a body. I'm the fulfillment of every prophetic declaration that flowed from their mouth. That's why the Scripture calls him the Word. So, Jesus, friends, is not a part of the story. And if we don't regain this, our attention will be scattered. And if our attention is scattered, our experience in God is scattered. If our experience in God is scattered, the generations are at stake. And the church weakens slowly but surely because a scattered church is a diluted church. There's one found worthy. I said there's one found worthy who can break the seal and open the scroll. His name is Jesus. Paul has to write to the Hebrews and the Colossians about the... Mat can I come down? No? Will it mess up the cameras? 
I can stay up here if you need me to. Just give me, give, give me a thumbs up. Paul has to write a letter. Most would say he wrote Hebrews. To the Colossians and the Hebrews because, for instance, they were too into angels. Now, I have been in certain events on the West Coast. I won't say where. It wasn't in California. It wasn't in Washington. So, <laughs> other place. It's a prophetic event. I'm not joking. It was a prophetic event. And I did not hear the name Jesus one time. I did hear about breakthrough. I did hear about revival. I did hear about moves. I did hear about mantles. I did hear about impartation. I did hear about portals. I, I did hear about angels. But I didn't hear the name of Jesus. Problem. I said, that's a problem. The most prophetic thing you could ever utter are these two words, Jesus Christ. His very being is prophetic. He is the true chief prophet, and his arrival on the earth is the fulfillment of prophecy. He himself holds the covenant together. He's the point fuel and goal of every biblical prophecy yet you walk into a, an event that would be from our streams and you don't hear his holy name that's about as prophetic as a dirty pair of shoes one time is this okay tonight I'm just paving the way for Pastor Benny and Bill. <laughs> I'm doing the John the Baptist thing. <laughs> just leveling out some high places, bringing some low places up, weed whacking here. What did I, what was I gonna say? Huh? No, no, I said something right after that. Anyways. No, I'll find it, I'll find it. I'll jump back in the river here. We'll find it. So, the church must return to her only message. Did, here's just a question. I mean, test out what I'm saying. When is the last time you sat in your church or maybe you're a preacher. When's the last time you taught on the incarnation of Jesus? Outside of a Christmas cantata. Here's another one. When is the last time you heard a teaching on John chapter 1? That literally shifted ancient empires and move them and tore them down and built them back up again regarding the identification of the Logos. This is the Logos, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. John literally turned Rome and Greece upside down with a chapter. When's the last time you heard a teaching that wasn't Mike Bickle on the Beatitudes. You say, who cares if we heard a teaching on the Beatitudes? It's the Magna Carta of Christianity. It's the greatest sermon ever preached. It's the Sermon on the Mount. It's the Father saying there is a new lawgiver who is greater than Moses, who scales a mountain like Moses did but never says, thus saith the Lord, because he is the Lord. I, I don't, I, I'm, my question is why? Why haven't we 
heard a teaching that is our faith. Why do we know more about politics than the Beatitudes? I'm not saying our faith should not infiltrate and bless and serve all spheres of society. Of course it should, but if you don't know the Beatitudes, you probably shouldn't be going into those arenas. No, really, I, these are honest questions. When's the last time you heard a teaching on the Upper Room Discourse from John 13 through 17 that is literally Jesus' high priestly heart posture? When is the last time you heard a teaching on the whipping post? It's important. It becomes more important when your body gets a report that it, you don't want. People say, why do you pray for the sick? I, of course, I pray for the sick because I love people, but I have a greater obligation to Jesus. I must not let those stripes be in vain in my ministry. I must pray for the sick. I am indebted. I, I, he, I can't waste that. When is the last time you heard a teaching on this one who wore a crown of thorns? Who traded heaven's diadem? Whose robe filled the temple with glory? Who knows no beginning and no end and wears a crown of thorns to redeem my cursed fallen mind? When is the last time you heard a teaching on Jesus the suffering crown wearer? Or how about Jesus who was stripped naked? That's what Matthew's gospel says. And they stripped him. Some of the most powerful words you will ever hear. They stripped him so that he would take my shame, that I might wear his righteousness. This is important stuff. Why? Why haven't we heard it? I'm not asking you the question so you'd merely answer it. I feel like I flew here today to provoke you to fall in love with Jesus. When's the last time you heard a teaching on him wearing a robe of mockery? It's a big deal. It's a massive deal. It shows me what true kingship looks like. It makes sense to hear from the man who is fully man and fully God who says, listen very carefully, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all types of evil things against you for my sake. It makes sense to hear that from a king who wears a robe of mockery. this landing I know you want to get tasered and shake on the ground you will you will you're just getting set up now so that when that happens you don't die here's an honest question When's the last time you heard a thorough biblical teaching on the crucifixion? That one breaks my heart because I feel like I'm in and out of many circles. I feel like I have a decent pulse on what our tribes are teaching and I can't tell you outside of like Pastor Benny, I can't tell you the last time I heard a teaching on Calvary that scares me to the core. We have no power if we lose our vision of the cross. We have none. We have no way of defining the faith. The minute the cross is no longer central, this thing becomes about us. You, <laughs> it is a guarantee. There is no way to properly define Christian faith 
outside of the cruciform sun. There's no way. All of the sudden, everything becomes about us to the degree, listen up, here's some proof of that, that we begin to claim Psalm chapter 2 as though it's ours. Ask of me and I'll give you the, in, the nations as your inheritance. That's the father talking to the son who just paid with his life and we think we get saved and we can raise our hand and go, I'll take the Bahamas. <laughs> Are we grafted into that? Of course. But you take Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection out, you think the Lord just gives the Philippines away? The nations are his son's reward for his passion. That's just the Bible. But that's what happens when you lose sight of the cross. You actually make the faith your own. I just got back from a, uh, the Billy Graham Library, they were kind enough. They literally opened it for our family on their day off, and they hosted us so beautifully. So thankful for the Graham family. And they allowed me to go spend some quiet time at Dr. Graham's grave. And I went, and I was just thanking the Lord for, for, for such a beautiful life. And I began to see a common theme throughout that man's life, Christ crucified. The cross is everywhere. You want demons to truly tremble? Let them behold the cross. Is this all right? Yes. You sure? Yes. Tell me when to stop, Raul. How much, what time do you need me done? Okay. Take your Bibles to Galatians 6 through 14. Sorry, verse 14. I know what I forgot to say. Yeah. So I was invited to uh, do a show on Christian television, which I'm thankful for. I really am. I did the show. I'm going to give you two, two examples that woke me up in God. The host probably has a church of about, I don't know, a great man, 15,000 people. Not that that makes you great or not, but he's a great man. And he asked me this question. What are you going to talk about on the show? He was going to interview me. I said, uh, uh, sir, I'm going to talk about Jesus. This was 10 years ago. And he said, uh, okay, and when you're done doing that, then what? And I go, uh, and I wasn't trying to be funny. I said, ah, that's all I got. I, I don't. So I've got, I've got nothing else to give you. And he's like, well, son, we have to fill 26 minutes. <laughs> Never forget it. And then he said, are you telling me that you can talk about Jesus for 26 minutes? <laughs> now, I had just come out of an extended two years of prayer and fasting and reading the scriptures. Nowhere to really preach. I was like, I could talk for 26 years <laughs> about the one I discovered all alone in my prayer closet. I was like, sir, just, just hit the red light on that camera. But I thought to myself, what kind of question from a leader in the body of Christ is that? I'm not, I'm not diminishing him. I'm, I honor him. But it woke me up. I thought, oh my Lord, what, what has happened? And then I was invited to do another show and they said, we read your book called The Jesus Book. Do you have anything deeper? And I had only written that one at the time and I was like, no, sorry, I don't, so sorry. And they said to me, well, our church or our following is already saved. So I'm not sure any more teachings on Jesus would, is what they need. They want the deep stuff. And I thought to myself, the deep stuff? Like what? What does that mean? Are you telling me if I do a show on dream interpretation, it's deeper than Calvary? Would it be deeper 
to teach you how to get a word of knowledge than a revelation on the blood of Jesus? I think we've lost true depth. We don't even know to identify, how to identify it anymore. I thought to myself, look, I don't have a story about a bright green angel wearing peacock feathers <laughs> who flew through my window in a ball of fire and caught me up into some dimension where there were little munchkins running around. <laughs> I don't have something like that, but I have met the bridegroom. Is that enough, sir? Galatians 6.14. Listen to this. By the way, this statement is coming from a man named Paul who was caught up to the third heaven and saw things he said that were too amazing to even articulate. So this is his resume. We're not talking about a spiritually shallow man who is void of encounter. Say amen. He, the inception of his life, the inception of his Christian experience is literally Jesus Christ appearing, knocking him off his horse, blinding him on the road to, Amas to Damascus. Paul knew encounter. Yes or no? Yes. Paul was familiar with miracles. Yes or no? Yes. And when you can shake a viper off your hand and keep enjoying your evening that jumps out onto your hand from a fire, when you can do that, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> when your own team, after you've been stoned st to death, stands around you and raises you from the dead, you know something about the gift of miracles. Yes or no? Yes. Okay, when you can cast out devils after a girl follows you for three days and have the gift of discernment sharp enough that while she's saying, listen to these men, they are servants of the Lord, Saul, Paul still identifies that as a demon spirit and casts the demon out of her. We're talking about a man who, who wrote 1 Corinthians 12 and the entire chapter on the gifts of of the Holy Spirit. This is not a man who is ignorant of the move of the Holy Spirit, encounters, and miracles. Can we all agree with that? Yes. Now this is what he says in Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should glory but in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I to the world. Those are some kind of words. John 8, verse 28. Would you go there, please? Is this okay tonight? You're sure? You're quiet. I think that's good. I think. <laughs> You're not going to email Raul and say, don't ever have him back again. All he did is talk about Jesus. <laughs> Hopefully. Listen to these words now. John 8, 28. Ha, raise your hands if you want what Matthew 5 promises. Blessed are the pure. And I didn't say it yet, but you're, you're wise to just raise them. It's Matthew 5, yes. Okay. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Okay. That is a present reality and a future reality. All right. So how many of you would say, I want a clearer vision of the Lord Jesus? Yeah. All right, let me read this to you. John 8, 28. Then said Jesus unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. There's more to that verse. I'll read it just for the sake of accuracy. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. Let's read that again slowly. 
Jesus said unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. If you read that in the Amplified, He is properly capitalized. Word, thank you. Listen to this language, and by the way, Jesus being lifted up here in John chapter 8 is not speaking about a song. Now, we love worship. Our team will tell you we are jealous over worship. I am into worship. We are all into worship together. We are meticulous. We want to get better. We want to learn. We want, to, we want our songs to be biblical and scriptural that we write or sing. We want to write about Jesus and write, write about him properly, and we want the nations to adore the Lord. We are massively into worship at Jesus' image. But that verse is not talking about singing. For example, when the scripture says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Oh, this one's, I know, you're going to throw your shoes at me. Because we've <laughs> anyone who grew up in our circles probably wants to kill me now. That verse has nothing to do with singing. That verse is not saying, if you sing, all the nations will come. Now, there are verses, however, that teach that worship draws the nation. So yes, that's true. We see that uh, in Amos' prophecy, by the way, when God restores the tabernacle of David, when worship is restored to, to the community of believers and they begin to worship like David did, the nations, the scripture teaches uh, in Amos' prophecy that the Gentiles will come in. And we've been, we've had a front row seat to that. Kathleen will tell you, we literally sing for hours at Jesus' image. On, uh, Raul will tell you, uh, and eight to 20 nations and every Sunday are represented because God responds to worship. It's way easier to preach an altar call in an atmosphere of worship. Preaching is easier in an atmosphere, in an atmosphere of worship. Great, listen, great preaching should lead you into worship. A missions movement goes, as a great missionary once said, missionaries go where worship is not taking place. For instance, we cannot pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and devalue worship because there is more worship in heaven than preaching. You know when you go to heaven, God will not learn from your sermon. <laughs> One time I was preaching before a girl got miraculously healed of stage four lymphoma, a 10-year-old girl who's still alive today cancer-free. She was dying just outside Yale Medical. She, she, I saw her go into a church. I had just started in the ministry. She's in Westport, Connecticut in a Lutheran church. She had no hair and a yellow beanie. Her name was Emma. And she walked into that church and I said to the Lord as though I had to twist his arm. I said, Lord, you have to heal her today. First of all, he doesn't have to do anything. But then he said this back to me so clearly. I will, gently. In other words, I love her more than you do. I will. You don't have to yell at me. <laughs> now go back and yell at yourself, Michael. But, but, but I, I, she had a yellow stocking cap. I began to preach. She was in children's church. I couldn't find her. That's, that's why I couldn't find her, because she was in children's church. And then I thought I was preaching really well, and I heard the Lord say, be quiet. <laughs> and I said, Lord, but I'm doing good. She said, stop talking. And I said, but Lord, I'm preaching. As though he were learning from my sermon. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that about me. Thank you for filling me in on that. The Lord doesn't learn in our sermons, but he does want to use them as doorways for him to come in. And finally, she came in. We laid hands on her. Within a week, every tumor was gone. Stage four, gone. God, yeah, God touched her. She's, she's wonderful today. 
wonderful today. I'll never forget that moment. So, however, worship is the lifestyle of heaven, therefore it should be the lifestyle of the church. I want to make that clear. But John 8 is not talking about singing. John 8 is talking about the crucified Lord. Now my heart is starting to burn right now as I talk about this. I hope yours is too. If not, ask him. The fruit of any good Bible teaching is this. Do we leave having said, did our hearts not burn within us when he opened up the scripture? If you're a pastor in the room, do not leave the parishioners shy of that goal. Teach them into a burning heart through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So John 8 says here, when I am lifted up, when you lift the Son of Man up, or when you lift up the Son of Man, then, say then, yes. then you will know that I am He. That's an amazing statement. This is the same Lord who said, before Abraham was, I am. That is the Lord's way of saying, I am the God of the burning bush. Listen carefully now. God has determined that you will never see Jesus as the I am unless you behold him nailed to the tree. We lose our vision of the cross. We lose our vision of God. What say ye of the Christ? How many of you believe Jesus is God? If you want to see him as such, you must behold the bloody cruciform lamb who is extended on a tree. This defines what a loving God looks like. If we do not see him through the lens of the cross, we are blinded to his glory. Glory is not, listen, at the core, a wonder, a sign and wonder. It is a wonder, but it's not a manifestation, biblically, which I would encourage us to be biblical. Yes? <laughs> okay. Biblically, glory is found according to 2 Corinthians 4, 6 in the face of Jesus. And what Jesus is saying here is something is about to happen and when it happens, you'll know who I really am. Now listen carefully. That makes no sense in the natural. How could him bleeding and dying, how could that be the way by which he allows us to see him as the Lord? Because this is what it looks like to be God, to come and lay your life down. That is why it is impossible to follow him without a cross on our back. You can't be part of the parade if you're wearing a different uniform. If the bridegroom out front is wearing an outfit made of wood that is a bloody tree, if we want to join the procession of the ages, we must take up our cross daily. Daily. Interesting. 
that the Roman soldier calls Jesus the Son of God because of the way he died. This isn't morbid, it's just Christianity. You say, I know, but he's risen. Absolutely, and he is risen with holes in his hands still. He's risen with a wound on his side still. He's risen with holes in his feet still. Why, why? So that we could see what true resurrection power and true resurrected life looks like. It looks like cruciform living. The happiest people, have you ever hung out with Heidi? Anybody here hung out with Heidi? In the natural, Heidi has many reasons to not be happy. She's as happy in Mozambique as she is in Laguna Beach. Why? Because Jesus said something that is so powerful. Listen to these words. He who holds on to his life shall lose it. But he who gives his life away, who doesn't hold on to his life, shall gain it. Listen carefully. How often do we take up the cross? Say daily. daily. That means that I lose my life daily, and the reward is the gaining of life daily. It is a simultaneous giving of life and the reception of divine life. Every time I say yes to Jesus' will and no to Michael's, I receive a holy injection of divine life. It's not just reserved for the future. It is the lifestyle. We are the lamb-like ones. Lambs do way more than just be quiet. Whenever we say lamb-like, we go, he's just quiet, occasionally bad. No. A lamb comes to die. Lambs come to die. And this, friends, is where the power is. You know, I think, Dylan, you, I think you'd agree with me. I think about the young men and women who emerged from revival culture. Who God is using right now. And he's using them with longevity. They're staying true. God is honoring them in the nations. He's responding to their ministries with power. It's the ones who know and preach Jesus. Somehow in our circles, this teaching arose. If you stay at the cross, you will forfeit the resurrected life. Eventually, you have to move beyond Calvary. No, no. You move beyond Calvary, you move beyond Christianity. Uh, let's just look at modern day revival history. What did Amy preach? Amy Simple McPherson. What did she preach? Christ as Savior, healer, baptizer in the Spirit, and soon coming King. That's called the Four Square Movement. What did Mother Edder preach? The day of the Lord, Jesus is coming back. Repentance through the blood of Jesus. Jesus is healer and he's baptizer in the Holy Spirit. She was a Jesus preacher. What did Smith Wigglesworth say? I have not come to you tonight to talk to you about healing. I have come to talk to you about the healer. Smith said, I, my, my wife's grandfather played piano for him. He said, I have not come here to teach you the method of salvation. I have come here to talk to you about the Savior. I have not come here to give you the 12 steps of being baptized in the Spirit. I have come here to introduce you to the baptizer. That's who these men and women were. They were Jesus lovers. And because they were Jesus lovers, they were Jesus preachers. You cannot be in love with him and not talk about him. You cut a Jesus lover open, 
their blood, I mean, their bones are going to go, Jesus, They're, they have nothing <laughs> left to say. Listen, they have been, they have been whittled away by the scalpel of the Holy Spirit. They've been reduced. Oh, hear me. God is not so much of the, in the business of adding to us. He subtracts in his goodness until all we're left with is Jesus. The more looks like removal. The more looks like fire. But he's a certain type of fire. He's a consuming fire. He swallows up all the other stuff. You start off in this thing, you're, Jesus is part of it. If you faithfully walk with him, he's all you've got. Hopefully when we breathe our last, he's all we'll hold on to. He's all that will matter. I've been with people at their deathbed. He is all that matters. You don't, know, you don't want to wait for that moment to, for him to be all that matters. You want to dig a well now. I could go on and on. What did D.L. Moody say to that man who wanted to preach? who had a sermon but didn't mention Jesus enough. He, said, uh, enough. he said, sir, go home and find something worth preaching and don't come back here until you're preaching Jesus. He said, is there no Christ in your sermon, sir? Then go home and find something worth talking about. This makes little sense when we are scattered. But it makes all the sense in the world if you see him rightly, whose son is he really? If he's God's son, he's everything. And he who is all cannot be part of. read you one more verse here. First Corinthians 2 verse 2. For I determined. <laughs> I love this. I determined not to know anything. Huh? You determined to not know anything? Good luck, unless the Holy Spirit's helping you. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ. Continuing to read, and him crucified. Here's a man discipled by Gamaliel, versed in philosophy, memorized the law, a Pharisee of Pharisees, he shows up to Corinth. He goes, this is my plan, to forget everything. Are, are you hearing the language? It, it really makes no sense in the natural. He's saying, I am determined. I am determined to accomplish something, to know nothing. He's saying, here's my goal. Here's the point and purpose of my effort. I want to forget 
everything I ever knew outside of Jesus. And this isn't coming from a dumb guy. This is coming from a guy who actually had something to say. He says, I'm determining to know nothing except Jesus Christ, which is really to say, I've determined to know nothing, therefore, I'm going to know everything, because everything has a name. His name is Jesus. So I'm going to forsake what is meaningless, that the world would consider everything, human wisdom. I'm going to forsake what the world deems as being wise, I'm going to consider it as nothing so that I might obtain he who is all in all. Therefore, I get everything. But he doesn't leave it there. He says, and him crucified. In other words, there's only one Jesus worth following, the one who came to die. Could you help me, Joel? Such teachings, listen, such uh, focus, such pursuit can almost seem too old school, too Sunday school. But they will keep you for eternity. This thing's got to turn. Years ago, I don't, for those of you who don't know, I used to play golf competitively for, it was what I did with my life. I played in college and uh, it's all I wanted to do. And I thought I'd make Jesus part of my story, you know. I went to University of Florida, so, you know, Tim Tebow's kind of our pope. <laughs> and uh, I wanted my path to be just like Tim's. I was like, Lord, let me win some tournaments. I'll even paint Philippians 4. I'll do whatever. I'll be the first guy to wear that on my cheeks like a football player. Just let me do what I want to do, and then I'll give you the glory when I win. And the Lord was like, yep, no, I don't negotiate. I don't need your help, I need you. I want your life. Lay it down. Be a sweet smelling fragrance before me. Come and die. And I fought that and one day I was, I was training on the back end of this driving range. My dad was with me. And my dad gave more to my golf game than, than anyone except maybe my golf coach, but probably more than my golf coach. And this wasn't like my dad. This had to be supernatural, what I'm about to tell you. So I'm hitting balls. And my dad goes, this is, a, this is after like 25 years of training. It wasn't like my first day out there. He goes, you really love this, huh? And I'm like, yeah, newsflash. We've been doing this 25 years, you know? <laughs> it was a really wild day. Four bald eagles flew over us. Four. And then one landed there on the range, and I was blown. I was like, wow, that's incredible. It was just really a surreal moment. And he says, uh, you love this. I go, yeah, yeah, I love it. And I'm just swinging away. And he's like, you, you love Jesus too, huh? Oh, yeah, Dad, I love Jesus. You love Jesus more than this? I go, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. He goes, then quit. Give it all up. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I would do that. Whoosh. He goes, no, no, really. I'm thinking, but you're the guy that got me into this. You're the guy that paid for everything. You're the guy that taught me so much of what I know about the game. How could you say something like this? He said, I don't know why I'm saying it. I'm like, well, this isn't what you tell someone when they're training for a tournament, to quit. He goes, I know. But my dad had been radically saved, been in the ministry at that time, filled with the Spirit, healed mightily in one of Pastor Benny's meetings of an incurable disease. He goes, I know, I, I don't know, I just felt to say it. I think you should quit and give everything to the Lord's call on your life 
which we believe is to preach the gospel, and everybody knows that about you. I was like, uh, can you leave? <laughs> you ruined my day at the golf course. I went home that night. I couldn't shake it. All I could hear was, you love Jesus? And give it all up. I wrestled with the Lord for two weeks. Two weeks of negotiating. He doesn't like negotiation. I don't care what people say. I went down every list that I could offer the Lord. Lord, I'll tithe. He's like, yeah, I'm not in poverty up here. I'm good. I don't need your money. You need to give. I don't need you to give. Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll make you famous. He's like, I'm already very famous. The name <laughs> Jesus is it's all over, everywhere. The date bears, my, bears homage to me. I don't need you to make me famous. I'm good. The name Jesus Christ is way more famous than uh, anything you could offer me in some trophy presentation. It's like, oh, okay, you don't need my help with that either. What do you want? I want everything. I want your heart. I want the core of your being. I want the epicenter of who you are. I want your deepest passion. And because of who I am, I am not going to share that with anyone. I want you to love me like I love you. I gave up everything for you. Now I need you to give yourself to me. After all, I'm the bridegroom and you're the bride. It's just what couples do. The bride loses her name in a Christian marriage and takes on the name of the bridegroom. Michael, I want you. I want everything. Two weeks went by. I was on my knees in my wife's closet which made it more hellacious. There were shoes everywhere. I'll never forget it. <laughs> my knees had holes in them. From I'm not joking. I, I put my knee down on a high heel. I was just weeping in there. It was like, for many reasons. <laughs> With tears rolling down my face, I said, uh, after two weeks, Lord, take it in an instant that's why the words of Jesus mean so much to me if you lose your life you'll gain it in an instant the most wonderful joy filled me those tears went from being tears of pain tears of regret tears of loss to tears of awe and wonder the presence of God filled that closet I will never forget it as long as I live. And I heard the voice of the Spirit say, why did you wait so long for this? Isn't this wonderful? And I've heard Bill preach this so many times. Yes, the price is important to talk about. We should. We need to introduce this generation to the price. But the reward is so much greater than any price we pay. That week, after years of praying for people and not seeing breakthrough, that week, I flew to Montreal. And I was preaching in a little Italian Pentecostal church, which was quite the scene. And I, I had about five minutes to go. The pastor wanted me done at a certain time, and I honor that. With five minutes to go, he said, you forgot to pray for the sick. And I said, okay, I've only got five minutes. He's like, just do it real quick. And so I said, Lord, heal your people, basically, and I was done, and then I dismissed in five minutes. Right after service, a, a guy ran up to me and shook me. He goes, I was healed when you said, Lord, heal your people. I hadn't seen anyone healed prior to that. Maybe one healing uh, every 18 months. I pastored a church in Orange County before that. Maybe... It's felt like two to five people got saved a year. Our church started with 400 and grew mightily to 75. <laughs> and never got above 35 or 50 maybe. We met in a movie theater. This is so funny. I remember one time asking for background music to our worship team. 
and this weirdest music came on. And I looked up and the, the promo for that movie, The Omen, started playing on the screen. And I was trying to pray for sick people. And I was like, Lord, deliver me from the ministry. This is horrible. But you know why that was happening? I was too alive. I was holding on to my life. I wanted Jesus to be part of my life. So, the man shakes me. He goes, I was healed tonight. I'm like, ah, are you sure? He goes, yeah, I'm sure. I said, healed of what? He said, I have a brain tumor. And I was like, well, I'd like to believe that, you know, I'm thinking. And I said, well, how do you know you're healed? He goes, because I felt it. <laughs> and I was like, okay, okay. That same night, Pastor Benny was preaching across town in Montreal. And he said, Mikey, come. He calls him Mikey. You can't call him Mikey. <laughs> but he, he says, Mikey, come across town and help me, with the, help me pray for the sick. Now, when I pray for the sick in his meetings, people would get healed like crazy. In my own meetings, never. So I said, sure, I'll show up. So I did. About 5,000 people there. Some guy grabs me by the shirt. It's this old Italian guy from the morning meeting at the, at the small church. He goes, I was healed this morning in the meeting. And I said it again. How do you know? <laughs> he goes, man, what, he's probably thinking, what's wrong with you? You're the preacher. You're supposed to believe. I'm helping your faith. He goes, I'll tell you how I know. He said, my head got so hot when you said, Lord, heal your people. Right where I had the tumor, it felt like fire hit my head. He said, and I could smell the people around me. And they had a guy next to him. He said, tell him what happened. He goes, when he said he felt fire hit, hit his head, we could all smell this stench coming out of his head. I got home. I flew back home. And the church sent me this MRI, a before and after. Golf ball sized tumor before, no tumor after. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You cannot buy or earn miracles, but you can yield in to the power of God. God uses those who give their lives away. And he gives them more than they could have ever dreamt of. Tonight, just look me in the eye. Tonight, many of you are holding on to your life. Many of you have never heard a teaching on the cross. Many of you have never heard what it looks like to truly love Jesus. Many of you have never heard the truth of our faith, what it really is. And tonight, maybe some of you have, but you've been holding on. You want Jesus to join your plan. And now you're realizing, he's not going to join my plan. I die into his plan, and he raises me from the dead. What I want to say to you clearly tonight, is Jesus will not adjust you and change you. He will replace you and give you a brand new life in Him. If you're lacking power, the true power of the Spirit, come and die tonight. Only dead wood burns. Living, words, living wood smokes. Dead wood burns. With every head bowed and eye closed, You say, Michael, you're talking to me. I need to give everything away tonight. I need to die. I want you to lift your hand. Okay, now I'd like everyone to stand up, please. If you raised your hand or wish you did, may I do this, Raul? Yeah. If you raised your hand or wish you did, I want you to come forward. If you raised your hand or wish you did. You might be a preacher. You might be a pastor. You might be a a missionary. I don't know. Cool. Come on. Pack them in. Pack them in right here. Ushers, help me, please. Come as close as you can. This is beautiful. This is beautiful and holy.
Worship team, would you come up, please? Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. These wonderful people are coming up. Many of them are weeping. When you respond to Jesus like this, the Holy Spirit begins to touch people so quickly. And I don't need to lay uh, hands on you. The Lord will. I want us to pray this out loud tonight. Everyone. I feel such a beautiful touch of the Holy Spirit tonight. How He loves to glorify the Son of God. I want everyone to say this after me. Heavenly Father, you offered Jesus to die on the cross, to shed his blood, Jesus, you said, no greater love can a man have than to lay his life down for his friends. Thank you for laying your life down. And tonight, you invite me to take up my cross, to deny myself, and to follow you. I sense your holiness in the room, your holy presence. The best I know how, I give my life away. You gave your life away. Take my life. Take my sin. Take my lukewarm heart. Take my bondage. Take my anger. Take these chains. And destroy them with the power of the blood. I declare from the depths of my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I declare that Jesus Christ lived a perfect and holy life. I declare that Jesus shed his blood and died on the cross. That he was buried and raised from the dead. And today, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. and will return again. Find me ready, Lord Jesus. Here I am. I turn from my own will. I turn from my wicked ways. I turn from the ways of this world. I turn from the devil himself. And I turn to you, Jesus Christ. Take my life. In Jesus' name. Now, you don't have to pray now. I just want you to lift your hands to heaven and receive like little children. I'm going to pray. And I believe that as I do, the blessed power of the Holy Spirit will begin to come upon you and empower you. Empower you to live this life in holiness and victory that many of you in this room will be called tonight to love and preach Jesus. That many of you, as Raul, I'll never forget that moment I was preaching for Randy Clark and he came to serve and help me. I said, the Lord is giving a burden for certain cities in America. And that night, Raul caught a burden 
for his hometown. And here we are tonight. That was two years ago. Wonderful Holy Spirit, I ask you in the name of Jesus to begin falling upon your people from front to back, young and old. Lord, in the name of Jesus, raise up missionaries from this place who have encountered your holy fire, who have found the one their heart's been burning for, the one their heart's been panting for. Oh, I'm feeling this strongly. That there are many missionaries being called tonight. Many, 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 many young missionaries under the age of 25. God is assigning cities in America and nations of the world to you. Holy Spirit, touch your people, empower them. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost come upon them. I'm telling you, the Lord is moving so beautifully right now. Just look at Jesus and receive. That's all you've got to do. You don't even need to beg. You just need to ask, Lord, touch me, touch me, touch me, touch me. I thank you, Lord, that this West Coast, that that mighty tsunami you showed me in a dream that was filled with joy and peace, that, 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 that mighty tsunami that hit California that was filled with glory, that that would come and touch the West Coast, Lord, touch this Northwest area. That your power, that your power and presence would begin to flow up and down this coast. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where's Raul? Uh, I want your mom and dad to put their hands on you. For me, right there. Bring him close, would you? Bring him close to me. Give me your hands. Put your hands on him. Lord, teach him the lowly way. Teach him the humble way. Teach him the way of the cross. Raul, the lower you go before God and men, the more he will promote you. The more you stay silent, the more the Lord will speak on your behalf. The more you make room for him, the more he will come and fill that empty space. The more you rest in the shadow of his wings, the more the divine light of the Holy Spirit will begin to shine upon you. The more you hide in that blessed shadow, the more the lives of those around you will become like a city set on a hill. May the broken come. May the fearful come. I want everyone just to very softly pray in the Spirit. May the impoverished come. May the faithless come. May the abandoned and abused come. May the deceived come. The scripture says, the entrance of thy word bringeth light. May the word of God flow through you. May he fill you with the treasury of the word of God. May the bread of heaven consume you. May bread flow from your heart those who want the nourishment of the Lord Jesus. I pray now with your mom and your dad and those in this room. I pray now that a hedge be about you. That the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ protect you. 
the Lord would protect you for these next few years. Your gaze would be lifted high above the swirl. And you'd be like Nehemiah, faithful to what the Lord has called you to. And when conversations begin below you, your response is, I am busy. I'm busy following the Lord. May the Lord bless you, but I'm busy. Let the grace and mercy of God cover him. I know you hear my prayer. Let your light shine through him. And may he live at your feet. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Would you all just lift your hands now to heaven? Holy Lord. Let your glory rest on your people for your name's sake. In this dark world, let them shine. Let them shine with your presence. As your word says, they looked unto you and their faces were radiant. Rest upon them, I pray. Fill them, I pray. Clothe them, I pray. Bring their lost loved ones to the cross. Bring their children to the cross. Bring their spouses to the cross. Bring our nation to the cross. Bring Seattle to the cross. And then we will know that you are He. In the mighty name of Jesus.